So hello everybody and welcome to Zoom. Um, my name's Kate and I am the director of The Big Draw. I am also involved in the charity based in, in Bath called the House of Imagination, which runs the, the Forest of Imagination. And I'm also involved in the Guild of St George and The Big Draw runs the John Ruskin Prize at Exhibition. So lots of different hats. And I'm delighted to be here today and very many thanks to Becky and all of the team at the Bath Digital Festival. Um, it's basically, it's a recap on something that my friend and colleague, Professor Tim Biner, did a couple of weeks ago on the well, 10th of the 10th. And just to set the scene very, very briefly, and I want to hand over to Tim, it was, it was, it was a little bit different to what we might ordinarily do. The Big Draw has been doing lots of well, live Instagram lives, basically. So where I get the pleasure, it's a privilege for me to be able to talk to all these incredible artists, creative change makers, designers, activists. It's fantastic. But what we wanted to do was do something a little bit different. So Tim came up with this fantastic idea of we do Instagram live, but we do it with Tim on the move. So it was a sort of a, a, a sketch and walk and talk in Bath, starting off at Bath City Farm and going down the hill into the town, making their way to the local football ground. I know nothing about football, as Tim knows, but that's OK, because the whole thing was a, a microcosm. So really, we wanted to, to thread out the themes about the themes about the impact on local community and local community assets. So really looking at things like the local pub, for example, the local football grounds and all those local community resources that have been so dreadfully impacted by COVID but we wanted to explore that through reportage illustration which is obviously Tim's bag. Um, we wanted to use it all as a case study and we were very pleased that Becky from uh, the Bath Digital Festival very kindly offered to invite us into this space today to do a sort of a recap on that but also to enable Tim to then take us to the next stage so it's continuing that conversation it's actually looking at some of the fantastic um, visuals animations that came out of the day linking in with some of Tim's other work and then opening up a conversation I think more around around the role of digital and digital drawing and uh, digital mark making in that space but also digital engagement and I think all against the backdrop of the COVID pandemic and the, the awful peril um, and situation that so many of us are finding ourselves in. Um, along the way I think we'll thread out maybe some of the challenges that Tim and I had on the session, what we learned. Um, so lots of different themes today I think. So if I hand over to Tim. Thank you Kate. Yeah no, um, morning everybody. Uh, thanks for joining and um, yeah so just an introduction for myself. Um, so as Kate mentioned there, I work at Basketball University. I'm a professor of illustration there. Um, and I think really I'm talking about the, a kind of working process today, very much bridging that gap between analog processes and digital processes. Um, and, and essentially using the idea that reportage illustration is a sort of form of storytelling, a form of visual journalism. And um, really, if you're making a drawing of uh, a local pub or a high street um, at a particular time, the, it's, that, it's the time that provides the context for the story. And this is a very sort of unique moment in time. Um, a lot of the work I've done in the past has been sort of sport related. So I wanted to sort of tap into the theme of Forest of the Imagination at the Bath Digital Festival around this sort of changing use of the landscape and changing use of the spaces that we occupy and live in. So, you know, so for many years, I've, I've, I've tried to sort of persuade people to or convince people to publish stories that have been made through line, shape, mark, uh, because a particular location in the world is going through an interesting transition. It's an interesting moment taking place there. Maybe it's an Olympic Games or a World Cup football tournament that's transforming a place for a short period of time. And the global spotlight is on that area. Um, and I don't know where the global spotlight is at the moment, but I think it's everywhere. I mean, I, I think uh, if you walk down a high street, everyone is very aware of behaving slightly differently. Um, but using that sort of uh, that, that kind of sporting metaphor of a, you know, three o'clock on a Saturday is when fans would be gathering in certain places, cafes, chip shops, 
pubs working their way to the ground. Um, that's that's not happening at the moment. And it seems that those places are, you know, this season is an interesting sort of story to try and capture and document. Um, so that's that's how we started the conversation. Um, I'm sure we'll explore lots of themes today. Also, I think the, the kind of sketch walk, what did you call it? Sketch walk and talk. <laughs> uh, sketch walk and talk. Yeah, I was going to say sketch walk, talk and drink, but I don't think that's, <laughs> no, no, right. that's, okay. that's um, a whole different audience. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I, I was also slightly aware that um, being outside, I think technically it worked really well, um, which was very pleasing. Um, we weren't sure how that was going to work, but it was very difficult to view some of the drawings that we made. So, again, I've got the opportunity to sort of share those with you today. And um, so, the, for, so for quite a lot of the talk today, I'll be sort of nipping, dipping in and out of sharing my screen to show you the, the outcome of those drawings and to provide a bit of context for um, previous projects as well. Do you think that's a good time, Kate, maybe to show one of the drawings, show what we did or? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm just thinking if I forgot to say anything, I think in terms of the sort of general housekeeping, I think because we're on a webinar format, um, people are muted anyway. So I think everyone's used to the drill anyway. There is a Q&A box. So if anybody does have a question, I will be keeping an eye on that and I can tread those through to Tim. So just yeah, to very happy to take, very happy to sort of have a conversation about about the work and the process, etc. So, I mean, I think when when you um, when you, it's always a slight sort of strange moment when you're sharing a drawing that is a very loose, sketchy drawing made in the moment um, uh, because there's sort of, there's always that sort of temptation and feeling that whenever you're, uh, an image goes public, it's got to be in some way refined and finished and developed. But actually what I really like about the process, and this is something that technology has really um, enabled for me is that you can present a really raw um, image uh, 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 to, to try and create that sort of mood and atmosphere of a particular place in any particular moment in time. And it does it really effectively. And actually, when you start to look at wobbly lines or a little bit of inaccuracy in a drawing, um, then um, it doesn't really matter because it, you, you're trying to just capture the mood of the event. So, uh, so, so this, uh, for instance, there's, uh, we, um, this was a one hour talk that we had, but I did maybe in an, an hour's drawing before and an hour's drawing afterwards. So it's about a three or a four hour period of time. And again, I think as a, you know, every story has got a beginning and a middle and an end. Um, it doesn't always work in a linear path, but um, in, this, in, in this way, I wanted to sort of try and emphasize that we start, we start the story on the outside. Uh, so we're up at the city farm and the, and the edge of the city overlooking Twerton Park, the football grounds in the distance. And then we end the story at Twerton Park just at 3 p.m. or 2.59, just before the game kicks off, sadly not able to go to the turnstile. So while they're just a set of drawings, so here we are up in the farm, here we are working our way down to closer towards the ground through the park where we saw again something that is entirely unplanned which is a thing i love about reportage work is um guy walking a dog um just sorting out a pitch pre-kickoff but there's a kid there with his dad kicking a ball he's got a number 10 england shirt on this game took place um during an international week so england were playing that week and actually it's it's a lot of the non-league football fans the sort of semi-pro um football clubs and football fans that provide a lot of the England fans that travel. So that was a nice connection between an international weekend and Twerton Park. Walking onto the high street, you've got uh, what would normally be people with scarves and uh, talk, uh, away fans working their way to the ground. You've got a person in a mask, not many people around really. Chip shops now closed, sadly. Uh, again, would have been full of people just getting their food before they go to the game. Um, an absence of people. The pub itself is a place now where that is actually showing the game. So they have a live streaming of the game, but these fans that are sitting there having a cigarette outside, they would normally be in the ground. And then as you go just to the entrance of the turnstile, this is the moment when the game's about to start, but there's just a couple of security guides, see, uh, guards seeing in the um, seeing in the uh, the director who you know one of the directors of Bath City who's, who's who has got permission to go in. So really, you know, you start on the outside, and I wanted to finish on the inside. But the end of this story is that we're not actually allowed on the inside. We we, we sort of finished just that kind of barrier. We're sort of kept out. So 
you know, they, while, while the images are in some ways unremarkable, they they sort of tell that that, that story. So, um, and again, I don't know, I, I might just sort of nip, shall I have a little sort of technical moment where I tell you a bit about how the drawings were made? Um, yeah, I was just about to say, I mean, um, it'd be useful to know, that, you know, procreate exactly what you're using, the pencil and everything for people. Yeah, so uh, if I just go back into, sorry, I'm... Um, I'll share a different uh, window this time. So I'm just going to play this film now. So Pro, I'm using an iPad and Procreate is the app that I've used to capture um, capture the uh, the kind of the history of the drawing. Um, it's very, you know, it's a very good, sophisticated app that's getting more and more um, technical and more and more facilities. The brushes are getting better. Let's see if I can move that. Yeah, sorry. Um, and, you know, when I, I think what I should sort of uh, mention here is that technology is a sort of facilitator for me. It's not something that is kind of making the decisions about how I make the work and what I do. I'm as interested in a pencil and a piece of paper, or a pen, particular kind of ink as I am the technology. It's just that this app this bit of software means that you can work very quickly and you can capture the history of a drawing and i'll show you a couple of films later that um has got some sound with it so again you can simply have two apps that are running at the same time one capturing any ambient sound of fans chanting or traffic or conversations that you might be having and then you place the soundtrack alongside the film at the end and then you've got a you've got an instant animation which was so it's kind of democratizing the process in a really nice way i think um, so yeah, you've got, you know, you started up at, the, up at the city farm and we're getting a little bit closer. You can, people are still, I think, fascinated with that process of drawing. So you can see when I wrote Twert and Chippy, if I was to write it in a book, I would go T-W-E-R. But when I wrote it on the sign, I was kind of, I was all over with the letters because I'm just looking at the colors and the shapes. Um, and yeah, very, very loose, very, very sort of uh, quick and immediate stuff. I've not put any sound with this at this stage. Occasionally you make a few notes. I think that says Baker's. I wanted to get the Baker in there, but uh, I didn't, you know, um, just part of the history of that drawing, I guess. Um, so, so yeah. I was, gonna, I was gonna pick up on what you were just saying. So that phrase, the history of the drawing, Tim, um, mm. it's something that we know from the work at the Big Draw that we do is something that people are fascinated by. And I think it links it also with what you were saying about this idea about the democratization of drawing and this idea that, well, as you know, full well, there's, there is still, still, still this whole thing out there of, is this a good drawing? And in some way that it's having to be some sort of end product that is in some way conforming to some weird aesthetic of a pretty or a beautiful drawing. I don't know, it's, it's, it's so annoying in a big drawing. We get it all the time. Um, and this idea of being able to have something that is um, far more fluid, far more immediate. Now, whether you're using, a, as, as Tim said, it doesn't, you could do it with a, a pencil and paper or you, you're doing it digitally like this. But there's something, I think, very compelling about the immediacy of doing something like this that is a lot more authentic and better captures the moment. And, and, and also being able to see, as you say, particularly in, in Procreate, you can, the animation almost, you can go back and you can go back and you can see maybe what you might call the mistakes. And then maybe they're not mistakes, they're just, well, you can see the thinking. It's the thinking of the development of the line and the story and where it goes. And I think that that's, it's interesting. And I think it also helps make the case perhaps to other people who maybe are not as confident to say, well, oh, hey, you know, we've got, We've got Tim here, very experienced, and you know, even he's he's finding his way around the page or around the screen. He's like, oh well, maybe I won't do it. Maybe I'll do it like this. You know, it, it it's a development. It's a sort of an ongoing narrative. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I t definitely agree with that, and I think part of what we're um, maybe we'll get on to talk to later on is kind of audiences for this work as well, audiences for your drawing. And I think what you said there, Kate, is really interesting because I think um, you know people are really fascinated with the process by which people, by which you, you draw, people work. And sometimes that's not always revealed. You know, I'm, I'm recording, you know, if you think of reportage illustration as a kind of visual journalism, then, then visual journalism largely is film, video, photography. And that process isn't 
ever revealed really it's you know the, the fact that a photographer might spend the same amount of time scouting the area working out exactly the right place where they want to get the right photographic shot from but essentially the moment that that photographer presses the shutter that that image is mirrored back to you and the process isn't ever sort of revealed to you whereas i think um the fact that the, the history of the drawing can play back to you in 30 seconds or a minute it not only sort of um helps uh, tell another story around the finished drawing, which might be a static image on a wall or published in print. It means that that work can have an audience on screen. People can kind of look at it closely and see the way in which you can learn from the way in which you might construct an image. Um, as you said, you can kind of capture the mood and atmosphere of a place. It's a record of a, of a period of time. So, you know, that this, this whole set of drawings were started at maybe 11 and finished at four. So, the, you know, there's a, it's more than that moment, that moment, you know, the whole process of that um, activity is recorded and captured in that, uh, in, in the film. And I find that really interesting. And I, again, I think, um, you know, while I've got a kind of history of working across lots of interesting activities around the world over 20 plus years, um, I'm, interest, I'm really interested in future activities and how the technology will change the way in which I'll be capturing and documenting new stuff in the future. I might just go back out of the screen and back into the sort of uh, the images. Um. I was going to pick up on a couple of points there, Tim, if I may. So I think, um, yeah, just picking up on what you were saying. So just thinking about that whole, the narrative, you know, we started at the top of the hill at Barcelona and then coming down. For me, your sketches, your drawings that you did on the day, obviously it's, it's the, the day wasn't static, nothing's static. And there's a movement there of us, you know, progressing down, you know, you, well, you, I felt like I was there with you, progressing down the hill. And those key markers of the landscape as you go along, it's, an, it's a developing image, it's developing narratives, it's shifting, it's moving around. And you can better capture that, I think, personally. Now, that's no disrespect to photography, which is wonderful as well. Um, but I think you can better capture that that movement, that dynamism within drawing generally. And I think particularly this type of illustration than you might perhaps be able to do with photography. Now, that might be very controversial, but that's just my personal feeling on that. Yeah, I've sort of battled with this as well a little bit. I mean, I work very closely with photographers and, and, and we share kind of journeys on, on, on uh, uh, things that we're capturing and recording and documenting. And I've, I think I've spoken in, you know, in, the, in the past that when I, when I recorded the 2012 Olympic Games for the Times newspaper, my access to the media centre was on the floor where the journalists were, the writers were, the copywriters, not where the photographers were that were processing, processing all their stuff. But just, just on a sort of... Uh, again, I mean, I'd be interested to see whether people in the audience agree or disagree with this. But, you know, there are moments in here that are snapshots. So um, nice moment when a Shetland pony walks in front of you and you just sort of draw that um, or a big dog. Um, and and I'm, I'm there because I want to draw the, uh, the, the football pitch in the background. But also there's, you know, there's Bass Bass train station here in the sort of right hand corner of the picture. You know, that white gap that I've left out completely, that's the world UNESCO heritage site that is Bath, that is Bath <laughs> the city that we live in. And that's the bit that you might expect to see in a, in a kind of sketch, walk, talk session in the city. Twerton is kind of on the edge of the city. And then the train line that, you know, carry on going all the way to the right and you end up in London, go through to the left and you, you you get the train through to Bristol. And just as I'm drawing there, you know, there's a moment there where the where the the train sort of goes from Bath to Bristol. And I thought, okay, that's a snapshot. That I've got to I've got to put that in. Equally, um this seat, this this seat was probably a little bit more to the left and a bit behind me. But you make a compositional decision to sort of place it in there because that seat to me makes me think of I wonder how many people have sat on that bench overlooking the football, maybe are a lifelong Bath City football fan thinking, I wonder if we're going to win this weekend. I wonder if we're going to get promotion. And so the seat, while it's not actually there in the composition, I'm constructing the narrative based on the things that I'm looking all around me rather than one single viewpoint. And I think that's a really interesting facility that drawing has. Some you might say that's not you know you're, you're breaking rules then and if you're in the life room you want to draw things accurately and as you see them 
And I think, you know, I do plenty of that. I do plenty of observational drawing where I'm trying to capture things as I see them. So I've got that um, kind of uh, motor skills to be able to kind of draw quick and in the moment. But I, I don't have a problem with assembling a composition that isn't necessarily kind of true. Um, but that maybe that, I don't know, that's a big thing to maybe explore. <laughs> Yeah, it's that sense almost of capturing the essence of it for you rather than a absolutely, you know, mirror. It's a, it's a slightly different thing, I think. But it's having the confidence to operate as an editor and to sort of yeah. say, I want that bench. I don't want that royal crescent in this particular mm -hmm. drawing. Um, you know, you, you're, you're providing a certain sort of hierarchy to the content that you include because in the end, that's what, that's what creates the story. Mm -hmm. One, I mean, one of the things, and you touched on it a little bit already in that whole, you know, the democratisation that, that, that drawing can bring. And one of the things that we touched a bit on when we were chatting the other week, um, which I, I just do, I do find it fascinating. It's this idea of drawing in some way opens up, gives permission and opens up opportunities and doors that you might not necessarily have access to if you were if you were going in with a with a different medium and I think I think the the example I was thinking of when when we did the thing the other week I was thinking of the illustrator the lady illustrator in the US the arms goes into the arms dealing conferences <laughs> in, <laughs> and, yeah yeah. And she's not going in with an iPad or a camera going, oh, how dreadful you are taking photos and making serious. So she's just sort of going in very smartly dressed, very sort of like, you know, I suppose there's certain integrity to her. They, they think she's one of them. And yet she's sort of walking around, but very casually. She's sort of making a few key sketches, you know, thinking. And actually, it's damning. It's absolutely damning what she's doing, recording the whole thing. Incredibly powerful. And yet it's given her a certain type of sort of under the radar access. Um, and I wondered what you thought about that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I think she's a really good example of that, you know, where, where um, you, know, the, we, you know, we live in times where the people are much more kind of image conscious. We're capturing images more than we ever have. And there's a sort of feeling when the phone comes out or a camera comes out, there's a certain sort of um, sense of, are you intruding on, you know, have you got permission to take that? Are you intruding on my um rights or my kind of privacy but somehow when you're when you're drawing um it it sort of attracts people they want to see what you're doing they want to be part of that rather than push you away and I, and I do find that interesting however I suppose slightly um that's one area where you know if you're drawing with a with a piece of te uh, with technology i.e a tablet a drawing tablet like an ipad it sort of sits a little bit closer to the camera and the, the, than a sketchbook does. I think I, I think there is something very um, different about a piece of paper there. I think there is an analog digital divide there, perhaps. Um, although I think with an iPad, some people I think people think I'm just a bit sad checking emails, work emails instead of doing <laughs> making a drawing. Yeah, yeah. You don't really know what you're doing all the time. <laughs> Who, who's the sadder taking the photos on their iPad, like <laughs> I do? <laughs> I'm just thinking because uh, of time, because you've got so many lovely visuals, Tim, to get mm. to. Um, maybe we could show a few more of your lovely drawings, or maybe one of your videos. Yeah, may, okay, maybe. Um, Up to you. Uh, okay so you've got some lovely content to share yeah maybe i'll show uh, what, what, while we're talking about the films maybe i will show you a film that yeah we're about a third of the way through so that has some sound in it um uh i'm just working out which i actually sorry i'm gonna um i'm gonna show you a drawing from um i can find the film Sorry about this. Um, little technical moment. I'm getting there. Got it. So this is uh, this is. Can you see a sort of drawing of what says Fan Fest and a big sort of uh, a lot of Russian yep. flags? Yeah. So, so this I can see is, that um, So this, uh, I'm sort of bridging that gap, perhaps between a um, between a, a a kind of journey in in uh, Southwest England at a time when there are no fans visiting a, a kind of local football team. And I'm comparing that with, or, or I'm trying to make a connection, I think, be, between um, a Russia World Cup in 2018 when the entire world was watching a controversial tournament for all sorts of reasons. Um, and I was there sort of traveling around the country as best as I could, um, trains, planes, and automobiles, and um, 
following various teams through the tournament. And at every host city, this is this is in Volgograd, so what was Stalingrad, a you know hugely historical uh, city with lots of um, you know history falling out of every part of the, the city. Very dramatic place. I don't even remember there was a there's a story in the World Cup there was a, where there was a, a complete influx of flies that made the whole kind of um, set of games at that time really difficult and so if I stood still drawing for any length of time I would get kind of covered with the sports swarm of these flies um, but anyway there's a fan festival and Russia did really well in this tournament and this was the moment before Russia played Egypt in a group game thousands of fans were gathering at the at the fan fest and before every kickoff there's a national anthem Russia's got a great national anthem uh, it wasn't sung in tune here this is just the fan singing but as i as i was saying before you can just have a little audio app in the background capturing the sound while i'm drawing the drawing would have taken maybe an hour 45 minutes an hour uh, and but but i just got that two or three minutes of, of of the anthem being sung and just placed that audio with the drawing at the end so i'll, I'll just play it back now I won't, I won't talk over it because it's it's kind of noisy <laughs> So again, you know, that that uh, I look at that and I think that, that kind of makes me think, oh, I want to see the game. I want to watch the game. It kind of puts me in the mood for what's about to, about to come. And I like the fact that drawing can almost leave you wanting more as well. It wants you, it makes you want to find out what happened next, I suppose. And, um, I really liked as well, Tim, I mean, apart from the, sort of the, the main um, structure of the piece, I mean, I love the way that at the top you've got like their little notes of other things that you've obviously spotted as part of the whole thing, you know, like somebody's vaping, yeah. uh, a hair bow or a tie or something, just those little tiny details. And then they're not at the bottom. They're not like incorporated. in. it's just like, oh, there's obviously somebody that's captured your eye. And But I, I, I find this certainly for me on a personal level. I mean, I'm, I'm not an artist, but I do sketch. I do draw, but just like knitting and sewing and all the other sort of creative stuff. But I find that, um, sketching helps me remember so the the, uh, the process of being there in the moment and doing the sketch or the drawing the memory I have of being there at that moment is so vivid so much more vivid than it might be if I was um somewhere and I wasn't taking visual notes I mean to be honest all the meetings I'm ever at either pre-covid or now I, I just scribble I mean you know I, I've constantly you know they're, they're scratchy they're just doodles and silly scribbles and, and and they're written as well but they're all sort of jumbled up together but it's it's a visual reminder for me and I can remember it so vividly those marks mean so much to me personally and I really recognize that in those little doodles that you had at the top yeah. there. the power of, of the mark <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I, I can identify with that. I mean, it, it is a, it's a funny one. I don't, I've got a pretty awful memory, actually, and uh, very selective. And there are things that, you know, I've got friends that I'm in touch with from school and they kind of reminisce and talk about things. And I think I've got no idea what you're talking about, but I can almost remember every drawing I've made. I don't know what it is, but you say it kind of connects with that um, experience of, of, of making, putting pen to paper or, digital mark on a screen you know it does have that kind of trigger for sure yeah i think someone might have just put a question in i've got a question let's have a look okay so i'll read it out shall i so it says love it that's good 
Um, so question. Hi, Tim and Kate. Good to be back in the Zoom room with you. Thanks again for your creative input on 10, 1020 for Forest Imagination and TEDx. I would be interested to explore further Tim's comment about the changing landscape. Tim, could you say something more about your working alongside students at Bath Spa University and how your own creative processes inform your teaching, especially any challenges with the balance of the digital and analog processes? Very good question. That's from the lovely Penny. Yeah, I think the balance the analog and digital within a teaching. And there's a few, there's a few sort of things there. I think Penny sort of touched on there to do with kind of changing landscape and changing sort of spaces. Um, if I just stop sharing that screen and I go back into uh, this screen. Um, take an image like this. Um, it's sort of time and you know the changing landscape is i think the the reportage illustrator is all about being in a particular place where there is a story to tell there's a moment to document and record and so the uh the the talk that we did kate on the 10th of the 10th um was tying into the fit theme of the forest of imagination around sort of the changing way in which we we're using the environment i think this is a unique moment in which we are going to experience the world around us and you know this was a very early editorial piece um i think it was a, it might have even been 2000 i mean it's a long long time ago um and it but it was a brief moment of calm in southern lebanon and beirut and again i just felt the urge to go there and try and capture it because it was the right moment in time to be doing that and it is often all about time and place so i think that's the one thing that uh, the images that i might have captured that they're all about sort of what's happening at that particular moment in time whether it's an olympic games in beijing which is all about china's uh integration into the world sort of a kind of coming out party look at us uh, or the controversy around the russia world cup it's it's really that unique moment in their history or the london 2012 a remarkable few weeks for london the next part of the question, I think, was to do with the, the delivery and teaching, um, how that sort of feeds into um, the delivery of the course. So I teach on a, uh, I don't teach on a specialised um, uh, illustration course, actually. I teach on a, on a graphic communication course, which is a broad-based um, design course. Uh, it teaches students that graduate into all areas of the uh, design industry, um, publishing, editorial, film, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, one of the things I'm trying to sort of introduce to all of those students is a confidence in being able to get their ideas down onto the page. And I think drawing is a way in which you kind of facilitate that. So, very, you know, one example will be I take every one of my students out to various museums in the city and we explore firsthand the collections, uh, whether they their collections, they might think, why am I in a museum uh, full of old fashioned drawings or why I'm in a museum full of machinery that I'm never going to want to draw, but actually as designers, they should be curious about the world and it broadens their visual vocabulary. So I'm a great sort of champion of the collections that, that are uh, within their access uh, in the city. However, this year we can't do that because I can't take a group of 20 plus students into a museum at a particular time, mainly because we have to explore museums in a particular way. A little bit, I was saying to them yesterday, it's a bit like, when I go into a shop a shop, and I've got to walk down an aisle one way and back up the other way and I've realised I've forgotten my milk and I've got to go back, people look at me. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to be very organised about we, the way we operate in the world. Whereas a museum is a place where actually being able to wander and explore and discover things is key. It's really important. So it's a real challenge, I think, at the moment about how I try and instill that sense of curiosity and, and that willingness to go and explore new things so what I did I was sitting in front of this computer screen yesterday thinking well the opportunity for me now is to explore beyond the museums that are in Bath so I've used YouTube I've used Instagram and I do some very quick warm-up drawing exercises in the spirit of Instagram where you just kind of scroll through so I do quick 30 second one minute drawings and we go to the Louvre and in the Louvre Museum I pick out 10 heads from there Instagram feed and we draw one head with our left hand, one head with our right hand. They're just kind of warm up exercises that we would be doing in a museum. Then I come out of Instagram and I go onto YouTube and I find a 45 minute walkthrough tour of the, Nash of the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. 
And it's a great walkthrough video because you're literally walking in with a guy holding the camera past, you hand your ticket over and you walk through the arch into the, you leave the traffic noises behind of Cairo and you walk into the grand atrium of this, of this wonderful museum. So I'm sort of trying to create the experience of going to museums, but effectively doing it on screen. But the, 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 the loss is that you can't be there, but the benefit is that I can go to Cairo, I can go to Paris, I can go to Oxford, I can go to San Francisco, all from our living room. So there are, I'm trying to find a sort of positive way in sort of approaching those collections. It's just, it's just a different way of teaching, I guess. That was I a fair follow up. Sorry, I just have had a quick follow up question to that actually, Tim, just in terms of um, with, when you were in the sort of the digital classroom or indeed <laughs> pre-COVID, do you find that with your students that there is a preference that they are more drawn or more comfortable with uh, analog or digital drawing or is it a very much a fluid dipping in and out of both and um, I suppose that's the first question and so the second bit of that would be do you find that there is the whole um, oh yeah I'm happy to design but I can't draw and the that discomfort about making a mistake yeah there's all, all of the above actually um they're, they're all very common sort of themes and I get that um and I think um I think the analog versus digital is interesting because we try and deliver a first semester in an entirely analog way so we engage in if we if you want if your only experience of printing is command p on your computer without ever selecting the colors or working out whether you're in cmyk or rgb or uh, what paper you're using, if your only experience is Command P, then you've got a very limited knowledge of printing. So we give all our students um, an opportunity to work in, in a screen print facility where they're producing colour separations, they're choosing the paper that they're working on, they're mixing the colours. Likewise, if your only experience of photography is, is your, your phone, then we introduce um, students to analogue photography and we develop a roll of film. Um, and that might seem old fashioned, redundant sort of technology, but I think you, you've got a better understanding of why you're printing something or why you're taking a photograph by doing those analog processes, by getting involved in those. We're not, be, I'm not, we're not being sort of, um, we're not ignoring those processes. We're absolutely recognizing that every designer is going to be engaged in all sorts of interesting technologies um, and, we're, and we're not hiding from that. that. That's built into the course later on, but I think that early analog phase is crucial, very important. Um, and the other thing I think you mentioned there was about the sort of confidence around drawing and um, working on a screen as opposed to sort of this sort of um, working on paper. Um, it's, it's mixed actually. I mean, I, 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 I sort of, in a sort of provocative way, I do ask students on a regular basis, if I'm meeting a group for the first time, sort of how many of you are confident of drawing and one or two will put their hands up and I'll say, but you're an art school or a design school. How many of you are confident with Adobe's creative suite and everybody's putting their hands up? So uh, I do get that, I understand that, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking that in a provocative way because I'm trying to um, uh, work with that group about how they recognize the importance of both and how you build a, build a confidence in both. And I think I've spoken before about the idea that if you become over-reliant on a single piece of software, or a, or a bit of technology, that technology inevitably will change and it narrows down your ability to um, work beyond that. So I don't want any tool to be the only bit of kit that I use, whether it's a piece of software, whether it's, a, I'm always looking for new materials and new ways of working. So Procreate happens to be very helpful, useful app for me to use, but as those apps become more and more sophisticated, actually I'm, I'm often looking for things that, are a bit more simple, especially when you're working on location in a frantic environment. So here is a good example. I'm in a crowded car park in Tokyo watching South Korea beat Italy in a semi-final or quarterfinal of a World Cup. Remarkable sort of night. And um, I've just got a pen and a sketchbook because if I've got, if I get a, you know, if I get an easel out and a board and my paints, the moment's gone. So you have to have a very restricted number of tools to work with. Then you go back to the studio and you work that image up into a painting where you've got all the kind of kit and facilities around you. Now, the brilliant thing about an iPad is that I can condense that all into the into the location environment. I've just I've just got the, the tablet with me and I can do all of those things. I've got a million colors to choose from. I can create an animation. It, it's remarkable. 
But at the same time, I, I still want to limit the amount of decisions that I have to make because the decisions I want to be concentrating on is, do I draw this person or do I draw that person? Someone over here is throwing a flag, someone over here is doing something. That's the only thing I want to be concentrating on, not the technology. And I'm, I, I think that's really key for any, any bit of learning is that um, it, it's not knowing how to use the technology, it's what to do with it. Um, I was just going to say, Tim, we're about two thirds through. Okay. Keeping an eye on the time. Um, one of the things that you touched on earlier that I would think you were wanting to thread out a little bit more. So you were talking this idea of technology opening up new audiences um, in real time, but also more generally, I think. Um, and obviously there are challenges around digital, whole new everything on digital, which we all are aware of, I'm sure. Um, but there are opportunities there, aren't there? for developing new audiences. So that was one thing I was just gonna, I was just keeping on the table as it were. And also just mindful as well that you have got lots of other lovely, beautiful videos that you might want to share. Yeah, well, I think that, yeah. oh, got a little bit of feedback there, sorry. Um, that, that idea of new opportunities, I will, uh, I will kind of, I'm just sort of scrolling up and down this PDF and I'll kind of try and connect with that story. So this is, this is supposedly a good drawing, right? It's, te it's technically good. It's technically sort of neat. It's proportioned, although I'd say the head's too small. So this is a drawing I made as a as an eighteen year old, um, you know, my first visit to the British Museum. Never been to London, etc. Uh, but I go back to this figure all the time. So this was a drawing from nineteen eighty five when I was a student at Camberwell. I was trying to design a poster for the degree show. And I go back to this figure again and again and again, and I'm less concerned about the accuracy of the figure, but just more concerned with that business of drawing over and over again. And this was a drawing I made uh, just before lockdown, actually, um, my last visit to the British Museum. So um, the figure's still there. It's part of the Enlightenment Gallery. And, I, and so I use those museums as a way of uh, maintaining the skill to be able to go out into the field, wherever that might be, it's a physical field or on location um, and to be able to capture things quickly and in the moment. Um, so that, that, that's, the, that's why I do I have the technical stuff. That means when I'm going to the Olympic Games and it's frantic and there's a million things going on and you've got very short deadlines that you're able to capture the mood and the spirit of that, of that moment. So going back to the sort of content generation, I think uh, over the years, and again, I'm interested in this through kind of research projects within the university as well. I think if you said to someone, do you know what reportage illustration is? They would, they might think of a kind of war artist or something from something that was very much associated with the past. Someone that was pre-technology out in the field capturing something because that was the only way to sort of uh, capture that story. And I think over the years, particularly more recently, actually coincided with um the, the, the way in which technology has enabled us to experience news in real time. So 2012 was the bit, was the moment, I think, when um, people were more comfortable reading newspapers online than buying them in print. That was the sort of tipping point there, I think, or the beginning of that tipping point. And we no longer wanted our news the next day. We wanted it in real time. So I sort of, over a period of time, realised that that kind of that activity that was once associated with the past certainly had a present and also was going to influence and shape the future in that illustrators were no longer sort of sitting waiting for someone telling them what to do or commissioning them to work, provide content for someone else's um, text or feature or article or story. But that as an illustrator, you can generate in your own stories, propose, make proposals to publishers, newspapers, um, organizations that, that that you feel your story would be beneficial to and persuade them to commission you to do it. So as the illustrator, you're generating new content. And with it, that, that that's a kind of an entrepreneurial skill, but it's also a skill that um, means you're producing work that otherwise wouldn't exist because if someone's not commissioning it, you can't make it. <laughs> so I, I, I really like the idea and I'm interested in that territory where the illustrators can generate new content, which in turn finds new audiences and if the illustrators weren't doing it, that work simply wouldn't exist. Very exciting time, actually. Shall I show you? Shall I show you a film from 2012? Because I always like sort of uh, showing that. So, yeah, they're so lovely. I think so, we've got we've got quite a bit of time. We're all right. A couple, couple of minutes on, on on this, then. So, 
we, we started the conversation today where I was talking about being on the outside of, of, of the football park football ground at Twerton Park, that sense of sort of macro and micro being on the outside looking in and then on the inside looking out. Um, that was a theme that I explored throughout 2012. So I started, um, I started the, I think it was a 20 day series of um, three, three times a day uploading content to the Times Online um, new, uh, Con, uh, website um, and I started on the outside at the opening ceremony looking in and I ended up at the in in the stadium at the closing ceremony so I'd sort of slowly worked my way closer and closer and closer to the to, to the activity so on the first um, I'm going to stop sharing again um, on the first uh, night I was on is it the A11 just outside um a mile end overlooking the the the, the ground um again i'm gonna i'm gonna be quiet when i play this because it's, it's quite noisy but it's a couple of minutes and th th there's some music with it which i'm not uh, I'm, that wasn't my choice the music but in the middle there's a there's a sort of firework display so it, i i'm recording i'm probably a mile away maybe maybe not quite but about a mile away from the uh, stadium itself uh, London's come to a standstill every what the global spotlights on that that amazing opening ceremony and I'm just recording it from a distance and very aware that as the fireworks are going up I want to capture it in real time and I just got a bit of audio of the fireworks going off and then I put the two things together sent it to the times and it was it was there at the end of the ceremony so I will just play that I just really like the immediacy of that you know it's, it's just uh it, it, it like you like we were talking about early on it it just takes you straight back there you know that's so lovely i'd love to share that i don't <laughs> know if you can share that with me afterwards but yeah, yeah. for sure yeah put it on our it's amazing I'll, really share, nice. I'll, 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 I'll just while we're on that uh while we're on that um let me find the 
yeah, this there's a we, we were talking a little bit earlier on about permissions and um there's two there's two images here well we've got a few minutes so just two images here so um i've been to two olympic games where usain bolt um got six six olympic golds six world records i'm a remarkable athlete so i've been in his presence sort of for about two minutes in his entire in, in his entirety and he's, he's he's made all those sort of world records this is victoria park so you've got the olympic stadium in the background he's running the 200 meters i don't know if you can see there's a little figure on a tripwire there i don't know if you remember our prime minister got stuck on a tripwire just before uh <laughs> so that that was my attempt that was my little nod to try and get boris in there <laughs> Little did I know where he'd be in a few years' time. He was mayor at the time, <laughs> and 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 this is an interesting one. So this is um, back to that idea of um, permissions and rights, and what what a kind of confusing time we're in in terms of technology and permit uh, and photographic image rights, etc. So uh, I'm not in the stadium. I'm in, I'm in the Olympic Park, and in the Olympic Park there was a big screen called Park Live. And that screen would have thousands of fans gathering who weren't inside the stadium itself. So fans would go and visit the park and just witness and experience the, the games without actually seeing being, being um, pitch side, if you like. And this was the night when Mo Farah won, won the first of his uh, gold medals, remarkable sort of gold medals. Um, and you've got the cycling velodrome in the background. And I took a, I, I, again, picked my iPad up, took a photograph of the screen with Mo Farah running. And then I drew, drew the scene really, really quickly. I mean, he runs quick, but I, 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 I think I drew, I drew this scene in the time that he ran the 5,000 meters. So it's not very long at all, which is why it's so loose. However, when we went to the Times, I dropped that photograph into the video screen because I didn't want to, I wanted a photographic sort of collage in there. And the Times felt uncomfortable with me being able to publish a photograph that I'd taken because I didn't have accreditation that allowed me to be a photographer. So in the end, they gave they, they used a, a Times accredited photographer's image of Mo Farah as opposed to the image that I'd taken off the screen. So it's just like, you know, it's sort of um, the kind of copyright and the permission around image rights at the moment is really confusing. It's very it's a very unusual sort of time that I can be I can make a drawing of someone but I can't, and I can take a photograph of that same scene, but I can't publish that photograph. <laughs> anyway, that's another sort of, uh, maybe that's an argument for another day or discussion for another day. So I think we've, we've got about six or seven, seven-ish, eight-ish minutes left. One thing I was just thinking was, just, so maybe just if we start to thread back to where we started from, and obviously thinking about Bath Digital Festival and all the sort of pioneering work that they are are developing there and I know that we've all been so you me Becky Penny all of us was who've been collaborating have been really keen to be thinking about a case study making some sort of case study potentially out of what what you and I did on, on the 10th the 10th the, the initial video that we did with the walk and, and obviously what we're doing here so I suppose I'm just thinking about if we move away immediately, if we move from the actual the drawing and thinking more about this as a format, you know, what some of those challenges, you know, what's, you know, what works and what worked, did, you know, did we both, I mean, I actually was, we have not, we've not done it at the big draw. We haven't done a, a big draw Instagram live with somebody on the move. So I was really pleased, for example, how that went. And I know we were both a bit worried about the sound, but actually it was fine, wasn't it? We got there in the end. So just thinking around that, but also in terms of, of today and, in terms of then thinking how that might be shaped as a case study, as a resource where that might sit, and we can obviously share it on one of our websites, and we, we mentioned this to Becky and, and Penny over the last few days, but maybe we're just thinking about that a little bit more, mm -hmm. as the, where, where the technology is going, you know, is what as a case study, as the project that's come together, all the different aspects of this, what's been what's been successful for you, what's worked, what would you say to other people who are wanting to try something different? What were the challenges? Well, I think actually, right. what what it's bringing closer, and more, more, what it's putting more emphasis, I think, on on revealing that process. I think not not just the conversation we're having, but the way in which we can share, uh, the way in which we're working. Um, so, what what this has added to the process is, okay, I'm talking about the fact that the drawing is no longer static; it can now move. In addition to it being able to move, it, you can have 
sounds, you know, sound, ambient sound, sounds from lo the location. But in addition to that now, you've also got um, the, you know, the, the footage of the artist, the illustrator, whoever it might be, the practitioner out in the field in conversation in real time. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, it is amazing, really. And, and being able to sort of slightly trip over yourself as you're going through a gate, as you're heading towards a, um, a high street, uh, going in and out of um, a signal in certain areas, just having a sense of how of what the what the weather was like. I mean, we were really worried about um, how the sound would work just because you're up on a hill and a bit windy. Um, but actually, I, I, I felt the technology was amazingly sort of uh, good at pulling all that together. And, you know, our conversations, I thought, were quite clear. I think we could, you could hear it. You could hear what we were talking and what we were saying. So I think from that point of view, the technology is just, um, you know, it's, it's only providing us with more opportunity to get to more interesting locations and places and, and not to be fearful of being able to capture that. And, and, and at a time when it is really hard to convince people um, economically, but also with, that, with, with, you know, to take a risk on projects. I think a lot of the projects we've talked about, I haven't said it, but it's also involved some risk, I think, on behalf of um, commissioners, commissioning editors, et cetera. Uh, yourself, Kate, to sort of do a, do an Instagram live, like you say, it's the first time we did it, um, and I, I think it should encourage us to realise we can do more of that, and, and it's only because the technology is there that we can do that. Keep pushing the boundaries. Yeah, absolutely. We have to try these things out. I mean, I didn't have I mean, the only things I had on the list really from the day that yeah, it was it was the sound, which we've talked about. Obviously, the weather. You're always. Who knows what the weather's going to do? We were lucky on the day. And the other thing I have written down that maybe we haven't touched on is for these types of types of online sessions, I think where there's a conversational aspect around, I think, I think actually it's important that you have a good rapport with the other person as well. And I think that that's a very, it's a very easy thing to overlook with all the technology and the skill and your skill with and everything else. But I think actually, if those two individuals are not gelling, you can tell. And I think I've been on a few sessions over the last couple of months where it's very clear that either one, they're just not on the same page, two, they hate each other maybe, or they just <laughs> don't really know, they don't really know their stuff. And there's been those sort of times where it just, it's not quite coming together. And I think, that's the hidden stuff behind the technology, isn't it? And everything else. So it's one of those weird things, even though this is all digital done, digi digitally done, it still needs to gel. Really the cool. individuals still need to gel. There is still that aspect to it of totally. the human behind the scenes. No, I'd hate to lose that actually. And, you know, one project we haven't even talked about, I don't think we can go into now, but I, I did, you know, after or for, while, while I've followed lots of big sort of um, busy sort of activities, I've also spent some time in some monasteries in some Eastern Orthodox monasteries where I've kind of lived with some very remote monks in Northeastern Greece. And again, they, uh, I, took, I took the technology with me and I worked in very traditional means as well. And I just felt at that time, mainly because the way in which the technology is working in these big sort of landscapes, it, it didn't feel like the right thing to be using. So I was moving back to more traditional practices there. However, I did include some digital work in it. And that was the stuff that the monks loved. <laughs> so I think there's a fascination from everyone with, with the way with the way it's going. But you're right, you've got to have that. Um, you've got to have that human sort of connection. Absolutely. Yeah. I think we've literally got about a minute left here. I don't think there's been any more questions, but I suppose what we would say would be if anybody does have questions, please do get in touch with either me, with Tim, with Becky, with all the team over at uh, Bath Digital Festival, with Penny at Forest of Imagination, or any of the TEDx team. So I want all the different layered organisations that have been involved just to get in touch with all of us. I think that's fine, isn't it, really? Absolutely. Tim, did you have any last final thought before we click off? Because I think we're down to our last minute. No, not at all. Just thank you for sort of facilitating, Kate, and, and, and Becky for putting it together. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's been really easy to chat and, and we've, we've, got, we've, co we've covered subject matter that I think we're both really interested in. So. Yeah, we'll do more. I'm sure we'll do more. And I, I suppose um, on behalf of Bath Digital Festival, just to say that obviously they've got loads more fantastic events over the next couple of days. So encouraging people to go onto the website and have a look at those to take part in those. All righty. Right, 11.59. There we go.
we're well, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Well, should we sign off? Yep. I will yeah, stop. and share that lovely thing with me. I will do. All right, Kate. Well, All right, then. Speak to you soon. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you to the team at Bath Spa, uh, at Digital Festival and Becky's team. Bye. Bye.